Well, good morning. I'm Dino Dave, and this is the Creation Investigation. Welcome to the missing links in evolution. So we'll get a little bit technical in this session, but you're a smart crowd and you can follow along. We'll be delving into evolutionary theory. And sometimes when people think of this idea of missing links, they get the idea of some kind of a wacky half and half sort of creature, kind of like this Kawasaki here, a redneck motorcycle. But really what I'm talking about is the missing links in the logic, challenges to evolutionary theory, difficulties, problems uh, that make the theory not hang together. Now hopefully this slide is already starting to look a little bit familiar to you if you attended our last session. The two models of origins that I would like to see taught in the school, one the creation model and in that origin by design, the evidence for design over against that, the evolutionary model with a natural origin. And then here you have uh, the creation model decreasing order, that is things were created good and they have at best hell level or maybe even degenerated over time. Uh, on the evolutionary side, you have to get from molecules to man. We talked about that. And on the creation side, catastrophism, that is the great geological formations that shape planet Earth, uh, happen quickly through catastrophic processes rather than slowly through uniformitarian gradualistic processes. And in this session, we're going to visit mostly on that first one there, and that is origin by design versus natural origin. Our jumping off spot in the scriptures tonight is going to be 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. And the apostle Peter here says, Knowing this first, there shall come in the last days scoffers, scoffers, walking after their own lusts. So the Bible predicts the coming of these scoffers. Now, what's a scoffer? That's a word that we don't use too often. Somebody put it into uh, the common vernacular. What's a scoffer? Unbeliever, yeah. Someone who's a skeptic, right? So someone that might be inclined to throw stones, be critical, especially maybe of the established order, uh, in this case, certainly the creation uh, worldview. Do we have scoffers out there today? Oh, yes. We live in a postmodern world where it's very much in vogue to uh, throw off all these various hierarchies, the meta narratives of the past, and to think in terms of maybe lots of little various tribal theories and, and, and uh, rebel against uh, the great structures of the past. So, this is very pertinent to the day in which we live. And not only does it talk about the scoffers coming, but kind of says what they're going to say towards the end times. Uh, verse 3 says, And saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Now, don't misunderstand. It's not that these people believe in creation in the sense of creation versus evolution. It's just that they believe things have continued on in a very consistent way from the origin. Now, what philosophy is that that says all things kind of continue on year after year after year over the great eons consistently since the origin? What is that philosophy? I hear it, somebody saying it out there, uniformitarianism. That's that uniform gradualism, the millions and millions of years. So these people are predicted. But not only does the Bible tell about the coming of the scoffers, the skeptics, and predict what they're going to say, but the Bible gives us how we can respond to them. And the Bible says that they're willingly ignorant of two things. They're willingly ignorant of the origin of the earth, the watery conditions of the early earth. And we're going to talk about that in the uh, first session uh, uh, tomorrow, uh, in, in our main session tomorrow, and then the Genesis flood. These are the two things they're ignorant of, and those are two of our, our upcoming topics. So we'll address that more in the future. But I like to say the Bible is more up to date than tomorrow's Google headlines. It is. The Bible predicts exactly where our world is going. Well, here's our outline for our seminar this evening. We're going to talk about the evolutionist arguments. I'm going to give you, as best I can from my study, their best arguments for the Darwinian synthesis, the, the Darwinian evolutionary viewpoint. And then I'm going to talk briefly about biological complexity and some mechanism challenges, and then we'll wrap things up. Now, we need to start by talking about what is evolution, because it's difficult to find two evolutionists that can agree 
on a definition of evolution. I've done these debates and it's hard even to get them to give me a definition oftentimes. And part of the reason is that there's these different evolutionary scenarios. We have cosmic evolution. That's the evolution of matter and energy in the Big Bang, what started the universe. So we have cosmic evolution. Then we have stellar evolution that mostly what's coming out of the Big Bang is just lots of hydrogen. Well, this has to clump together eventually to form the stars and the planets and, and actually make some of these heavenly bodies out there. And then out of these stars will be synthesized some of the higher elements and you have chemical evolution. And then you have organic evolution. Organic evolution is how do we get life? You know, you got this universe that's supposedly 14.5 billion years or whatever year, years old. And then just around 4 billion years ago, you have life. And so how did life come about? The origin of life from non-life, literally from just rocks and water. We'll talk about that. And then you have macroevolution. That is different, disparate kinds of creatures. How do we get these different kinds? And then you have microevolution, which is variations within the different kinds of creatures. Now, of all these different types of evolution, only one has ever been observed. Which one is it? The variation. I don't even like to call it evolution. It's been observed long before Charles Darwin came along. But this variation, this built-in capacity that God built into all organisms and their populations to vary and change. So, for example, we've got really big dogs. We've got really little dogs. They're both still dogs, right? We've got big horses. We've got little horses. And we both evolutionists and creationists agree they did share a common ancestor, and it was a horse. See, I don't want to talk about dogs and cats. I want to see the dats and the cogs. I want to see the in-betweens, right? So variation within a kind is accepted both by creationists and evolutionists. We believe God built this in as a survival mechanism so that uh, organisms could survive in d diverse uh, environmental conditions and in different uh, areas of the earth. Well, Richard Dawkins, in his book, The Greatest Show on Earth, gives what I believe are the key arguments for evolutionary theory, the best evidence they have. And he talks about poor design. And this goes all the way back to Darwin, pointing to the poor designs and that this couldn't have been created by a creator. And then biogeography and vestigial structures and the fossil record and homology. Let me kind of rephrase things just a little bit into five key arguments for evolution. Five key arguments for evolution. And, and you read the evolutionist books of people uh, like Richard Dawkins and others, you're going to get these five pretty consistently mentioned. The first one is biogeography. Biogeography. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but this is the idea that if we look at what organisms live where on planet Earth, maybe we can learn a little bit about their evolutionary history just as they migrated and traveled. For example, lots of marsupials down under in Australia. Maybe we had a common ancestor that was a marsupial, okay? And, and so this type of thing. Uh, and this is uh, 2003, the National Academy Press. They say, historically, the geographical distribution of organisms across the globe was considered evidence of evolution. As animals migrate and diversified, more local common ancestors gave rise to similar organisms. Recent books on teaching evolution no longer give it as an argument for evolution. For example, the National Academy of Sciences book, Teaching About Evolution and the Nature of Science, only mentions it historically. So they'll bring it up from time to time, but by and large, Biogeography has been discarded. Uh, it, there's been a lot of problems with it. Uh, for example, here's a quote uh, of 2008 uh, from Evolution News and Science. It's far from true that biogeography unambiguously supports common ancestry. Indeed, there are many tenacious problems of biogeography and paleobiogeography that do not square well with the evolutionary paradigm of common descent. So there have been as many problems as there are arguments for evolution. This would probably be their weakest. I'm starting with their weakest, and eventually I'll get down to what I consider their best. Okay, the second one here we're going to move quickly to is embryology, and that is this recapitulation theory of embryology. And this goes all the way back to Haeckel and Darwin's time, and it's this idea that an embryo, as this embryo is developing, reenacts or mirrors its evolutionary past. And so it goes through these various stages that kind of mirror where it came from. And uh, this idea has now been completely discredited, but it's still in school textbooks. It's still in school textbooks. It was presented by Haeckel, who, if you remember from our last session, was the leading 
uh, voice for Charles Darwin's views in Germany. And he did a lot of research into this, and it, the evidence today suggests that Haeckel actually fraudulently altered the data to make it look like this is the case. Here is his famous drawing of embryos. And you can see we've got a fish over on this side developing along, and then a salamander, a tortoise, a chick, a hog, a calf, a rabbit, and finally humans on the end. And notice up here, you see along where the neck is, you kind of see these folds, these uh, that look almost like gill slits of a fish. And of course you have the abdomen is uh, kind of going down there and it's somewhat uh, like a fish's tail. It hasn't fully developed. These are just stages of development. And Haeckel showed it like, well, all these very diverse organisms look a lot alike. Maybe because we all came from a fishy common ancestor and all breathed through gills and swam around and had a tail. And it's kind of sounded superficially a little bit interesting, but they never really presented why. Why would an embryo relive its historical evolutionary past? There's no reason for that. It should be whatever is the best for development should be chosen. Uh, but they made a really big deal about these gill slits here. You see these, these little wrinkles, and supposedly they all had these little wrinkles stage at the same time, and that shows that we all have this common ancestor. Well, if just wrinkles around your neck prove that you once had a fishy ancestor, well, how about this guy? Is he going back to being a fishy ancestor? I mean, these embryos never breathe through them. They're not actually gills. It's just a developmental stage. It's just the process of how things develop looks superficially that way. But, you know, it's worse than even that because that's not how the embryos look. This is a better illustration of how they look. And you see nowhere in this illustration do they ever line up and have that similarity. They just don't. And yet Darwin considered it to be the strongest single class of facts in favor of his, his, of his theory. Haeckel called it the biogenetic law. They made a big deal about this. It was prominently presented in some of the later versions of The Origin of Species, and yet it's been completely discredited today. Despite it being completely discredited, it's still in textbooks. Now this is a shame. This should be a complete embarrassment and should discredit the evolutionists. Here we have Darwin's fake drawing still used in a modern textbook uh, by Donald Permathero bringing fossils to life, an introduction to paleobiology. And there it is. Crazy. All right, let's go to number three. We'll spend a little more time on this one, the fossil record. What do we see in the fossil record? Well, amongst other things, we see extinction. We see what looks to some people to be intermediate forms, and we see sequences, general sequences, of simpler things on the bottom and more complex things higher up in the higher layer, layers. And so these things seem to be things that would lean towards supporting evolutionary theory. But what I want to do is take a big step back. Let's look at the broad view of all the fossils we see in all our fossil archives and all the different museums and different collections. And I want to give you some really big general observations about the fossil record. Number one, the fossil record is characterized by abrupt appearance. And I'm going to support these assertions all with quotes from evolutionists. And for every one I give, I could probably give another 20 or 30 of them. These really aren't in dispute amongst, uh, for example, paleontologists. Here's Stephen Jay Gould, Harvard University, leading evolutionist in his book, Panda's Thumb. All paleontologists know the fossil record contains precious little in the way of intermediate forms. Transitions between major groups are characteristically abrupt. Abrupt. That is, maybe there's this type of an organism, and all of a sudden, poof, there's this type of an organism, and we don't find those in-betweens. This one just abruptly appears, fully formed fully formed. And probably the biggest problem in this regard for evolutionists is something called the Cambrian explosion. In these lower layers, which evolutionists date till 600 million years ago, you have all of the major uh, designs, all the major types of life forms, the phyla, appearing in a geological instant, like poof, they appear almost like out of nowhere, like they were just created in a geological instant. Here you have, again, a quote from Stephen Jay Gould. He says, the fossil record has caused Darwin more grief than joy. Nothing distressed him more than the Cambrian explosion, the coincident appearance of almost all complex organic designs. The Cambrian explosion. I've talked about this for years, but last night I went home 
I opened up uh, a website uh, called Evolution News that I look at from time to time, and, and this was the article that appeared in my inbox last night. It says, why evolutionary biologists are fatigued by Darwin. Quote, increasingly evolutionary biologists acknowledge in the peer-reviewed literature that there is a serious problem with the modern Darwinian synthesis. The decorated Cambrian paleontologist Simon Common Conway Morris calls it Darwin fatigue. According to Conway Morris, the unresolved problems exposed by the Cambrian explosion have opened the way to a post-Darwinian world. Though you wouldn't hear it from Bill Nye the Science Guy, and you wouldn't read it in a high school or college biology textbook, real-life biologists now live in the wild west of evolutionary thinking, where multiple models compete to replace neo-Darwinism. Why is this? Current research shows that the number of organisms and the generations required for the neo-Darwinian mechanism to produce complex features for ex far exceeds the probabilistic resources realistically available over the history of life on Earth. It's just not plausible. Even assuming all the best scenarios for evolution, it's not plausible that these complex organic designs would come about in a geological instant. So this abrupt appearance. Here's a quote from Eugene Koonin. The Cambrian explosion in animal evolution, in which all the diverse body parts appear to have emerged almost in a geological instant, is a highly publicized enigma. Major transitions in biological evolution show the same pattern of sudden emergence of diverse forms at a new level of complexity. So abrupt appearance. Again, I'm talking big picture. Abrupt appearance is a major feature of the fossil record. But then once organisms do appear, stasis. That is, they stay mostly the same, slight variations, but they pretty much stay the way they first appeared. Here's Niles Eldridge, um, American Museum of Natural History. He says this, it's a simple and electable truth that virtually all members of a biota remain basically stable with minor fluctuations throughout their duration. And then the fossil record is characterized by major gaps gaps between types of organisms. Here's Ernst Meyer. He's a professor emeritus of uh, Harvard University. He says, given the fact of evolution, one would expect the fossils to document a gradual, steady change from ancestral forms to the descendants. But this is not what the paleontologist finds. Instead, he or she finds gaps in just about every phyletic series. What's a phyletic series? Well, it's ancestors to descendants, to descendants, to descendants, you know, the grandchildren, the great-grandchildren suppose an evolution through time, and in this they find major gaps. They can't clearly identify, okay, this evolved into that, evolved into that, and evolved into that. Now you can make up stories. Look, you can take any large collection of things, and you can say, well, I think this is similar to that, or similar, and you can kind of line things up, right? You can do that with Legos. You can do that with, you know, seashells. You can do whatever you want. I'll tell you a story. Let's talk about fossil machines. Let's say that there's a nuclear war and, and everybody on planet Earth gets wiped out but a few people and they're just like subsistence living and then maybe a few generations later they kind of establish a civilization so they have enough free time, they start digging in the Earth and they find fossil machines. And one guy finds this fossil called a tractor. Another character finds this fossil called a locomotive. And then someone comes along and says, I think that tractor, over millions of years, evolved into that locomotive. And the other guy says, nah, that's not possible. And they keep digging, and they find the missing link. There it is! It proves it, right? Now, I'm being a little bit facetious here. Obviously, we know that you know, a steam engine locomotive was before either of these two, and, you know, there's major differences besides just the size, you know. But you can just make up stories, my friends. That doesn't make it science. That's just someone's hypothesis. And we need to be careful how we treat these historical speculations as compared to observable and repeatable science that can be verified with the scientific method. Now, as we dig into these rock layers, we find various things, and people begin to date them. For example, they'll say, well, this down under is a lot more simple than this that was found up above. And a lot of times we don't always find them all in the same area. We just find maybe some limestone with something in it, and they have to date this limestone to see, okay, well, it, you know, where is it? Is it deep? Is it, is it high here in this particular location? And my question is this. How do you tell the difference between a 100 million year old Jurassic limestone and 600 million year old Cambrian limestone? It just looks like limestone. 
How do they know the difference? Just from looking at these stones. Does anybody know? Okay, the fossil record. Very good. Typically, people will say, well, maybe it's radiometric dating. And not typically sedimentary layers, but more uh, igneous layers, volcanic layers, this type of thing. They do use radiometric dating. But these basic methods for dating the rocks were established long before radiometric dating came along, even back to the time of Darwin. See, And they do it by something called index fossils. That is, they look at particular fossils that they think only lived in a particular time. And if that type of fossil is in there, they say, well, we know it only lived for maybe during the Jurassic, okay? So it's talking about dinosaurs, perhaps, a particular type of dinosaur. And then it went extinct. So it didn't evolve to Jurassic, and then it went extinct. So if we find it, that's an index fossil to tell you that rock is Jurassic. Does that make sense? So, for example, here's uh, some of your index fossils, and you see things, okay, a trilobite. Uh, I've got a, a trilobite here. This is an actual fossil that, you know, look, uh, World uh, of Science said it was 60 or, 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 or six, 600 million years ago, so it's got to be 600 million years old, right? Oh, right. Uh, trilobite, index fossil, Cambrian, 600 million years old. Well, here is a lobe-finned fish. And in this particular diagram, you see the lobe fin fish was considered an index fossil. The rocks that contained that were 80 million years old. It's going back to the time of the dinosaurs, these lobe fin fishes. And then somebody that didn't know any better, a fisherman caught one alive off the coast of South Africa. Well, now what does it mean if you find a rock with a lobe fin fish? It doesn't mean anything. It could have been yesterday, right? And so what happens is there's a lot of speculation about when these things evolved and when they went extinct. And really, at the end of the day, it's circular reasoning. That is, they date the rock layers by the fossils that are found in it, and then they say, well, these things were in the lower layers, evolved into these things, evolved into these things, evolved into these things, and that proves evolution. Well, if you're using evolution to date the rock layers, then yes, it's going to prove evolution. It's circular reasoning. And evolutionists have admitted as much. Here's Tom Camp in New Scientist magazine. A circular argument arises. Interpret the fossil record in the terms of a particular theory of evolution. Inspect the interpretation and note it confirms the theory. Well, it would, wouldn't it? Problems for evolution within the fossil record. Here's Oxford evolutionist Mark Ridley. And he pretty much throws the whole thing out the window. He says, in any case, no real evolutionist, whether gradualist or punctuationist, uses the fossil record as evidence in favor of evolution as opposed to special creation. So he's pretty much given up on the fossil record entirely as evidence for evolution. Number four, mocking the idea of a designer. And this started with Darwin. It's called Darwin's Riddles. And Darwin would say things like, well... If I was a designer, I wouldn't do it that way. That's a bad design. You know, or, or why did he do it this way? And uh, so we have what's called the panda principle, which talks about supposed bad designs, and then vestigial organs or leftover organs. And these are, are sometimes called Darwin's riddles. And so Darwin says, why would an intelligent designer make odd and curious designs? It seemed to be poorly engineered. I mean, if you're a god, why don't you just make an elegant design, you know? And uh, why would a creator employ different designs to accomplish the same task amongst organisms and then use the same pattern for very different purposes in other organisms? You know, it's like, well, if you figured out how to make, uh, you know, a good thumb, for example, why don't you give a good thumb to humans and give a good thumb to the panda? And Stephen Jay Gould's book is entitled The Panda's Thumb. Because, you see, the panda has a thumb that's different from ours. His thumb is more like these two fingers where you can squeeze them together, which works perfectly well for stripping the bamboo, but it doesn't have an opposable thumb for grasping. So this is a bad thumb, right? Why, why couldn't a creator make a, a better thumb than that? And then why are there evolutionary leftovers or vestigial organs? And so Stephen Jay Gould asks this question in his book, The Panda's Thumb. Odd arrangements and funny solutions are the proof of evolution, paths that a sensible God would never tread, but that a natural process constrained by history follows perforce. So let's ask the question, why would God make these odd designs? Now, what's interesting, I talked about William Paley in our last session as the guy that came up with the watchmaker argument for design. William Paley in his book, Natural Theology, 
written before Darwin, actually answered this question. It's funny how the arguments really don't change that much over time. We're still arguing about the same stuff that Paley and Darwin argued back in the 1800s. But Paley in his book, Natural Theology, on page 34 says, why resort to contrivance, odd designs, where power is omnipotent? Here's what he says. It's only by the display of contrivance, the existence, the agency, the wisdom of the deity could be testified to his rational creatures. Here's what Paley's saying. Follow me on this. Odd things grab our attention. Let's say my friend Kevin and I are marooned on an island in the middle of the ocean. And we're tired of eating bananas and coconuts, and we're just hoping to get rescued. And all of a sudden I say, hey, Kevin, look out there. There's a bottle floating up and down. See it there in the waves? It looks like it's got a piece of paper in it. Maybe it's a message or something. And he says, you're right, Dino Dave. Why don't you swim out and get it? Says, okay. So I swim out, get this thing, bring it back. We pop the cork. We bring out the piece of paper, and it's just a bunch of lines. What's that? I mean, that's not a message. I mean, maybe at best it's a barcode or something, but I mean, but what if instead of lines, it's a little odd squiggle and then a dot and then a kind of curly cue and some other, ooh, th- th- that, there may be a message here. I mean, maybe it's hieroglyphics or maybe it's something we don't understand, but there could be a message, right? It's the odd, curious things that grab us that there's, there may be a message in here, see? And what Paley is saying is God is trying to tell us something. Hey, look, my friends, God could have made Three flower colors, red, yellow, and maybe orange. But God made millions of variations and diverses of all these, right? He's telling us something. He's like saying, look, I have incredible intelligence. God could have made three stars. One, two, three. That's cool, right? You know, you have a triangle. There it is. That's, 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 our three, that's our constellation, right? But God made trillions of stars just to show us his omnipotence and his power. God's communicating something to us. And why does God make a curious design like a panda's thumb and these other things? He's trying to say, hey, look at this. Let me get your attention over here. I could make one thumb. I'm making lots of ones, and they work just fine. And and, and by the way, they're a problem for evolution. Do you know you've got human eyes? You've got octopus eyes, which are completely wired differently. You've got, you know, these compound eyes of insects. You've got, you know, well, it's hard enough for evolutionists to explain one eyeball. And God made a whole bunch just to kind of communicate. Hey, look, this is creation. It's not evolution. So God is giving us a testimony to his rational creatures. Let's talk about vestigial organs for a minute. Maybe you heard about the tailbone. Don't you know, Dino Dave? Your tailbone, this useless little thing coming down here, at the end of your spinal column, that is evolutionary evidence of your ape ancestry. Back when your great, 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 grandparents were swinging in the trees. Well, I like what the old fellow said. He said, some of my ancestors may have been swinging in the trees, but they were swinging from the neck, not the tail. Some of you guys will get that on the way home. But I never understood this argument anyway. Like, what's the benefit of losing a tail? I mean, there are times where I wish I had a tail. Wouldn't it be convenient? You could close the door behind you. Hey, I play piano. It would be nice to be able to catch some of those low notes down there with a the tail, you know. Uh, I'm kind of kidding a little bit. I fell out of a tree once. It might have been helpful to have a tail. But where is that an evolutionary benefit? No, it's not a vestigial organ. It's a place where muscles get attached. Try doing without it. Try sitting down without it. You'll find you're very thankful that you have your coccyx there at the end of your tailbone. How about the appendix? The human appendix is one of the classic vestigial organs. Here it is, this little tiny finger down here, right where the large intestine and the small intestine kind of connect. And they said, it's left over. It's a vestige. Why? Well, because we can cut it out and it doesn't seem to hurt people, so it must be useless. Careful about that. Sometimes we just don't know what something does. Hey, I had my appendix out and I'm surviving fine. Well, recent research... By evolutionists has shown that the appendix has an important function as a safe house for helpful bacteria. So if you have something that shoots right through your whole, you know, intestines and basically wipes you out, all your, your, your good uh, bacteria is gone, you know, you're going to have a problem because we need that helpful bacteria to digest our food and get our nutrients. Well, it's there in the appendix and it can kind of repopulate and come back out into your, your, your intestines. So if I got some of these nasty diseases... I might have some real difficulties that maybe you guys wouldn't because I don't have an appendix. 
Now, today we have ways of kind of repopulating artificially, but if you have a disease like dysentery and you don't have an appendix, it could be a major problem. So, it is not vestigial. It does have a purpose. Our final one is nested hierarchy. In my opinion, this is the best argument for evolution. Darwin called it homology, but it's this idea of similarities between organisms that are of the same general category. Let me illustrate. Here we see various mammals, and you have what is a one, two, three, four, five fingered structure in all of them, a pentadactyl limb, five fingered structure. In a monkey, he will use it to manipulate. He'll you know, open bananas, he'll climb in the trees with it. A mole, one, two, three, four, five, will have it as part of a spade-like hand that he uses for digging. A dolphin will have somewhat modified, but these five fingers, he'll use it as a flipper in swimming. And a bat, again, these same five, very different from a bird's or a pterosaur's wing, but these five fingers will help support his wing membrane for flying. And the evolutionists will say, well, maybe it would have been better to have six in a dolphin or maybe 19 or 20 in a mole. But they were stuck with this pentadactyl limb structure they inherited from their ancestor. And so they had to kind of modify it. Evolution had to kind of tinker with it. But that shows that we all had a common ancestor with five fingers. Now, there's a big problem in that these develop from different genes in these different organisms. Yes, they all end up with five fingers, but they don't all come from the same genes. And if there's anything we should be getting from our common ancestor, it's the genes, right? That's supposedly what, and evolutionists never discussed this. So that's a major problem with it. But we do have this ability to group organisms. So you might superficially group organisms and say, well, maybe a bat's closer to a bird because they're both flying. But structurally, it's limb structure, it's skeletal structure, it's closer to a dolphin and a human. It's a mammal, it has fur, it feeds its young milk, and it has this pentadactyl limb structure. So, you know, it is, they would say, well, they all had a common ancestor. And that, in fact, this goes all the way back to Darwin, right? He says, it's truly a wonderful fact that all animals and plants throughout all the time and space should be related to each other. And he said very clearly, if my theory be true, numberless intermediate varieties must assuredly have existed. Now, we already told you that they haven't found them. They haven't found these in-betweens, that we don't have the fossils for all these. But they talk about a tree of life. There was only one illustration in Darwin's book, and it was this, a tree of life. Now, if in their trees of life, they could point to a clear common ancestor that they all agreed on, like this was the original life to non-life non -life to life, and from there, that, you know, that common ancestor brought all living things into existence. That would be good evidence for evolution. If they could point to some definitive transitional forms, right where things are splitting that are kind of half this and half that, that would be good evidence for evolution. If they could show, not all through it, but at least some places, a gradual change into two very different kinds of organisms with all the fossils in a line, the phylogeny to support that, that would be good evidence for evolution. They don't do that. They don't do that. Don't take my word for it. Here is Stephen Jay Gould, Harvard University, leading evolutionist, quote, the extreme rarity of transitional forms in the fossil record persists as the trade secret of paleontology. The evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks have data only at the tips and nodes of their branches. The rest is inference. However reasonable, not the evidence of the fossils. So you look in a textbook, you'll see a tree of life like this. What is that? some goo? Uh, who knows? They don't know. How come we don't see half this and half that? What's right there? What's right there? What's it? We just see fully formed fish, fully formed dinosaur, fully formed horse, fully formed human. Show me the half human, half apes, you know? So fully formed things, you don't see these transitionals. So a better pattern of life would be something like this. Now follow me on this. Just watch, watch this illustration for just a minute because I think this will click. This will make sense to you. Um, you have a group of organisms, call them dogs, and they're all, there's a variety, right? But they're all quite close to each other. They're, there's a big gap between them and the cats and a big gap between them and the pigs, for example, just to give you three things. And, and yet all these three are closer together, they're all mammals, than maybe over here the reptiles, where you have snakes and you have lizards and you have dinosaurs. 
those, there's gaps between them, but they're clustered closer, and there's this huge gap between them and the mammals. Now, you, that's the actual data. Now, you can draw a tree around this, and that would be your evolutionist's interpretation where the tree kind of comes down through here, or you can take that same thing and you can say, we're going to draw a creationist interpretation where the dogs have always been dogs, the cats have always been cats, and the horses have always been horses. It's just how you interpret the data. This tree of life has fallen on hard times in recent years. Here is New Scientist magazine, 2009. For a long time, the holy grail was to build a tree of life, says Eric Batista, an evolutionary biologist at Pierre and Marie Curie University in Paris, France. A few years ago, it looked as though the grail was within reach. But today, the project lies in tatters, torn to pieces by an onslaught of negative evidence. Many biologists now argue the tree concept, concept is obsolete and needs to be discarded. Needs to be discarded. But still, we have to ask the question, why would a designer design groups and then groups, and then groups, kind of like Russian dolls. You ever seen these Russian dolls that fit each within each other? And, and, and that's kind of how life's forms are, right? So we have mammals, and then within mammals we have the dogs and the cats, and we have the different families, and then over here with the reptiles, and we have these different ones. Why is that? Here's a wonderful book. You could delve into it a little more called The Biotic Message, and basically Remind says this, the organized pattern of life calls attention to a single designer, not a common ancestor. Now follow me on this. The bigger error throughout history has not been evolutionary thinking, where there is no God. The bigger error throughout history has been the belief in many gods, many idols. And so God wanted to send a message to us, not just that he's a powerful creator, not just that there's plenty of gaps between evolution, uh, forms that kind of stands against evolution, but also that there is a common ancestor, there's a common designer to this not a common ancestor. So it calls attention to a single designer that had a broad scheme, not a bunch of different gods making all kinds of unrelated things the way that they think they might be made. Okay, what about the handful of transitional creatures? When you go to evolution and say, well, the big picture of the fossil record is there's no transitional forms. There's not one kind of thing evolving into another. They say, oh, we beg to differ. Oh, really? Oh, yes, we have Archaeopteryx, Tiktaalik, the horse fossil sequence, and the whaling. They always throw the same ones out. There are these little few exceptions to the gigantic rule of large gaps and no transitional forms. But let's talk about these same ones they always keep putting out. Archaeopteryx is a strange bird. It is a weird bird, no doubt. It has teeth in its beak. It has claws on its wings. as a true tail, not just feathers, but actually vertebrae that go down in a true tail. Archaeopteryx means ancient wing. And some evolutionists said, well, maybe it's kind of half dinosaur. It's a dinosaur that's halfway to being a bird. Here's Alan Fiducia, World Authority on Birds from the UNC Chapel Hill. He says, paleontologists have tried to turn Archaeopteryx into an earthbound feathered dinosaur, but it's not. It's a bird, a perching bird, and no amount of paleo babble is going to change that. Archaeopteryx has these perching claws. He's got fully formed feathers. The modern structure of the feathers of Archaeopteryx and their organization to a wing as an airfoil are typically bird-like. Evolutionists are dying to find something that's kind of like a half dinosaur, half bird. And they've tried all kinds of things. In fact, there was Archaeoraptor. Now, this was prominently featured as breaking news in National Geographic, and then it was shown to be a fraud. But they were so eager, they just ran with this thing. From the remote Liaoning province of China, an unusual dinosaur fossils made a mysterious journey from the hands of Chinese smugglers to the polished halls of the National Geographic Society in Washington. It may be remembered as modern paleontology's greatest embarrassment. Well, long before you're going to have a dinosaur that has fully formed wings that can actually fly, he's going to have poor legs that can hardly walk, and so he's going to be sorted against. It doesn't make any sense. What about Tiktaalik? Don't you know, Tiktaalik is this fish. He's starting to crawl up on land and become the first amphibians, tetrapods, to walk around on land. So people have suggested that this odd fish, it's kind of specialized fish, it's got a flat head, and it does have these uh, rather unique uh, fins here, but its limbs could not have borne the weight of walking. Its fins are clearly fish-like. The very part that should be evolving into toes isn't. In other words, it's not even that pendactyl limb that's supposedly the common ancestor of all uh, tetrapods. 
yes, maybe it could kind of crawl around through the rubble and the debris and, uh, you know, just amongst swamps and this type of thing. But look, we've got creatures today like this hand fish and the frog fish that kind of amble up on the land and go back down into water. I mean, are they evolving into amphibians? No. Uh, we have the air-breathing lungfish. Besides, we have fossil trackways in Poland that the evolution themselves have dated to 10 million years ago. I mean, way earlier than Tiktaalik. So how can Tiktaalik be the first thing to start transitioning to walking on land? Doesn't even make sense. How about the horses? This series that you see right here, prominently presented in textbooks for many years and still in a lot of the textbooks. The place that you would go to see it is the American Museum of Natural History. And they would have them all lined up to tell you about each of the different ones. And what they didn't always tell you was that some of these were in the exact same layers and other ones were in higher layers. It wasn't in the nice, neat order that they kind of presented them there. And Niles Eldridge, all the way back in 1989, said those textbook pictures are lamentable. It's a classical case of paleontologic museology. Someone's just making stuff up. Just telling stories. But I actually went to the American Museum of Natural History last year, and they have changed the display. Now they say, a textbook case revisited. They still show the old guys there in the background, but now in the front they say, well, you know, even though it's in the textbooks, we now have signs that cast doubt on their own famous horse evolutionary display. They're giving up on the horse evolution as it's been classically presented. But what about whales? Whales, supposedly, are something like maybe cow or a hippo, some kind of a mammal creature that went back to the water. So we evolved from fishes, we come up out of the water, and the whales are mammals that went back to the water. What makes them say that? Well, part of it is this pelvis. You see these little bones out here? That, the evolutionists say, are vestigial leg bones. He once ran around with legs on four legs, just like, you know, mammals today. But he fell in the water and he started swimming around. And now we just have this little leftover pelvis. It's useless. It's a vestigial organism. That's what a lot of textbooks still say. But newer research has turned the long-accepted evolutionary assumption on its hips. Quote, instead of being just vestigial, whale pelvic bones play a key role in reproduction, according to a new study, no hip bones, no baby whales. Um, and the article's entitled, Whale Sex, It's All About the Hips. Um, I want to be very polite in mixed company, but let's just say at certain important times for producing baby whales, those bones support real important organs that allow the whole process to continue without them. You don't have babies. Okay, here is Encyclopedia Britannica. The evolutionary origin of whales remains controversial amongst zoologists. Now, my friends, you can tell stories all day long. But we got to get really good at distinguishing between people's wild speculation, hypothesis that often gets changed over time, and the observable scientific facts. I'll tell you a story. See how you like my story. Clouds are 99% H2O water. Watermelons are 92% H2O water. Therefore, the cloud and the watermelon share a common ancestor. Story. Okay, let's real quick touch on biological complexity and mechanism challenges. Did you know there's no such thing as simple life? Single cell creatures, simple single cell bacteria are crazy complex. We've got all these amazing little parts in here because we have the cell nucleus and we have the ribosomes and the mitochondria, the energy plants, and we have the Golgi apparatus and we have, the, you know, these transportation mechanisms and we have waste disposal. And we have energy processing plants and, uh, you know, ways of shipping things from one part of the cell to another cell trafficking. And it's just all this crazy amount of complexity and the cell wall that kind of holds it all together and the information that's all packed in the genome in there. And yet... How do you have a cell that has some of those, but not all of it? Nobody can answer that question. We used to think life was kind of simple at the cellular level. We are even now trying to understand a lot of what these cellular machines are doing in there. Ridiculous, crazy complexity. Talk about the DNA. The DNA of one human being, if you stretch out all your chromosomes, would go back and forth to the moon 100,000 times. Unbelievable amounts of of information, yet that DNA could fit into a teaspoon. More information than all the world's 
supercomputers combined. If you just look at the DNA, what's the chance that just from rocks and water, you're going to get a long DNA molecule full of information for that first cell, all the control kits, all the DNA markers, the interacting RNA that communicates with it and says how to turn it into proteins uh, because we're basically mostly proteins and water. That's what we're made out of. Then you need the ribosomal machinery. Then you need the enzymes that time all this stuff. All that's going to come together just by chance? It boggles the imagination. I don't have that kind of faith. You know, you, you, you think just by getting a bunch of apes in a room, randomly typing at a keyboard, they're going to produce all the works of Shakespeare? This is silliness at the profoundest level. These types of things are not realistic scenarios. So we have to ask, how could life come from rocks? And here is a, a wonderful quote in uh, 2018. The transformation to a primitive living cell capable of further evolution appears to require overcoming an information hurdle of super astronomical proportions, an event that could not have happened within the time frame of the Earth except we believe as a miracle. Oh, I thought the problem with creation is we can't allow these supernatural miracles. But it's okay to have a miracle when we need to get rocks to life? By the way, how about scientists? Have they been able to produce life in the laboratory? No. Even with all our intelligence, even with millions of dollars of equipment, all the best we've been able to do is we've been able to like uh, add in some methane and ammonia and we spark it and we, over here we had some, uh, you know, uh, I got some boiling water in here and it condenses out. And down here, some red goo collects. What's that red goo? Well, it's amino acids. And, and if this amino acid could be combined into a long chain and then folded just right, which the odds of that are really small, it'll form a protein, which will be maybe a ball bearing or a hook joint or one little component to put together a machine of which there's thousands and thousands of machines in the cells. And even if you did get life and you put it in that environment with methane, ammonia, and electric sparks and boiling water, you'd kill it. So we can't even get close to this. And yet you believe it happened just like out on a warm little pond somewhere with no intelligence? Look, if all you needed was just the raw ingredients, I could get the raw ingredients of a frog, I could mix them up real good in the blender, the toasterizer, and just leave it. Would it reform into a frog? No. You'd have a sad day in Frogville. Yet you read things in textbooks like this. This was Darwin's warm little pond, the famous prebiotic soup. The prebiotic soup would have contained organic building blocks dissolved in water. That's evolutionary analysis. Here is zoology, 2020. The early organic molecules accumulated in this primitive ocean to form a whole hot dilute soup in this primordial broth, and it lists all these complex uh, organic chemicals. And, and, you know, it keeps talking about this soup, this soup, this soup. Here's ecology. Uh, 2020, page 470. Recently, it's been suggested that hydrothermal vents are a potential site for the origin of life on Earth. Vent water may be the ultimate soup in the sorcerer's kettle. Soup, soup, soup. I'm waiting for Campbell's to come out with primordial soup, and there will be your grandfather right there in the can. <laughs> well, I'm being a little bit sarcastic. Remember a guy by the name of Louis Pasteur. In the 1860s, Louis Pasteur disproved spontaneous generation. That is, life can come from non-life. He showed, no, you, 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 know, you can't just take this soup and put it out, and all by itself, this dead soup is going to create mold. No, he, he sterilized it, and he showed that if you left out a soup that was unsterilized, the spores of mold would fall on it, and you get mold, but the one that was sterilized and its kinked rim didn't expose it to the falling spores, that had no mold. And his process of boiling, sterilizing, we still use, it's called pasteurization. We drink pasteurized milk. We have pasteurized yogurts. But really, Louis Pasteur is most famous for establishing the law of biogenesis. That is, only life begets life. It basically kills off this whole idea of goo to you via the zoo. It's a law, it's a scientific law, no known exceptions. Life doesn't come from non-life. And if you need a creator to start with the first form of life, well, then why can't he just make the various kinds of organisms just like he says he did in the book of Genesis? Complexity. Even a single cell. But then you start looking at these biological systems. Like, how about the eyeball? 
Charles Darwin, in his book Origin of Species, says, to suppose the eye could have been formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest degree. It gave him pause, but he tried his best to explain the origin of the eyeball. Did you know, we talked about the complexity of one cell. Did you know that in the retina of your cell, less than two square inches, there are 100 million light-sensitive receptor cells? Wow. Boy, that psalmist hit it on the head when he said this, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I like how a guy by the name of Michael Behe illustrates it. He illustrates life's complex systems by a mousetrap. Now, I'm a trained scientist. Don't try this at home. I'm going to set this mousetrap. I have never yet hurt myself or anybody in the audience, so here goes. Okay, I just set it. Now, this mousetrap is set. It's ready to catch something. But a mousetrap is composed of these various parts. And we could liken this to a complex biological system. There's only the three parts, the base, the hammer, the catch. I'm sorry, six parts. The base, the hammer, the catch, the bait, the spring, and the holding bar. And so six is not terribly complex. But let me ask you a question. If I took away one of these six parts, how many mice would I catch? Zero. Why wouldn't I catch five-sixths as many mice? I'm only missing one part. It won't work, right? You see, all the parts have to be together at the exact same time, or it doesn't work at all. And when we look at these complex biological systems, even something as simple as the tail of a microscopic bacterium, single-celled organism, has a little tail called a flagellum. This flagellum is so tiny, this flagellar motor, you can put 8 million of them across a human hair. 8 million across a human hair. But we look at this and we recognize all the parts. Can you imagine being the first scientist to look at this thing? Hey, Charlie, I've got an outboard engine here in my microscope. Whoa, what's that doing in there, right? But we make outboard engines and we know what this is. We can recognize rotors and stators and bearing and hook joints and we know what all these pieces are. But we can't make outboard engines this good. This thing runs at 100,000 RPMs. Now, somebody that knows about cars, what would happen if I ran my car up to 100,000 RPMs? Blow the engine, right? Jet airplanes are running at 100,000 RPMs. But try this with a jet airplane. This thing can stop and reverse direction in a quarter of a turn. Let me show you a little animation of this amazing outboard engine. Look at that. You see all those parts, and it's, that, it's kind of moving like a corkscrew there, and it just kind of is making that bacteria be able to move through fluid, so if it eats all the nutrients in this area, it can move to another area. Very important, with one, by the way, there's about 40 different proteins that are involved in that flagellar, much more complicated than a mousetrap, but if you don't have one of them, it's dead in the water. Now, this is 2023. It's an article in Creation Matters. The more we know about the flagellar motors, the more we discover how astonishingly similar they are to human design motors, including gears, rotors, axles, drive shafts, bushings, ball bearings, brakes, clutches, scaffolds, hinges, universal joints, adapter rings, sockets, switches, stators, capacitors, fuel channels, sensors, and control units. My friend, we're talking about a bacterium, a single cell bacterium. The bacterium can swim through water at 200 body lengths per second, the equivalent of a human swimming at 760 miles per hour. Tolerances are very small. For example, the gap between the drive shaft and the bushing must be small enough that fluids don't leak out of the cell. Yet it must not be so tight that the two seize up. An insanely small margin of error. This is a secular journal here, Science, and this is 2017. The bacteria flagellum exemplifies a system where even small deviations from the highly regulated flagellar assembly process can abolish motility and cause negative physiological outcomes. Now, we got a lot of complicated words in there. Somebody, can somebody translate into English? What is that evolutionist saying? It's easy to break. You got one small mistake and it doesn't work. Why couldn't he just have said that? Biological complexity. Big problem for evolution. We're only beginning to see how big. Mechanism challenges. Natural selection is supposedly the driving force of the Darwinian story of evolution. Natural selection makes a nice story, but it does not create anything new. It's like quality control in a factory. It weeds out mistakes. Something is really bad, maybe a congenital birth defect, it's going to die quickly. Something born with a bad limb, it's going to get quickly eaten by a predator, that type of thing. But it's a rough process. There's lots of stuff that's happening in the world. There's environmental changes. There's a lot of just 
stuff that's pure luck. Like, is this fish better of all than that one? No, it's not survival. The fittest is survival, the luckiest. He just happens to be on the right side of the mouth, right? And Ecclesiastes says as much, the race is not always to the swift nor the battle to the strong, nor yet favor to the man of skill, but time and chance happens to them all. So natural selection is a really rough tool that maybe things like white creatures in the Arctic, you can explain that, but it's not going to see down into some tiny little mutation that is, through many steps over millions of years will put together some complicated machine. It, it doesn't even have a benefit yet. And, and those type of slight things can't even be discerned amongst the noise of the background. Even if natural selection was up to the job, there have not been documented mutations to add useful new information to be selected. You see, mutations, overwhelmingly, are either neutral or they are deleterious. They do not help organisms. You get things like two-headed turtles. This doesn't add useful new information, just kind of shuffles things around. And so here we have Werner Gitt. He's the head of the German Federal Institute of Physics. He says, information only arises through an intentional volitional act. There's no known natural law through which matter can give rise to information. Neither is there any physical process or material phenomenon known that can do this. Here's an evolutionist, Shapiro, and he says, as many biologists have argued since the 19th century, random changes would overwhelmingly tend to degrade intricately organized systems rather than adapt them to new functions. My friends, I got to wrap things up, but some of you may be interested in this type of thing. Let me just mention that there's a couple, three other major difficulties. Difficulty in assembling proteins. Douglas Sachs got a great book, Undeniable. It talks about since the Big Bang today, there's no way you can even get one useful new protein, much less all the millions that would be needed in the Cambrian explosion. Sexual reproduction. Why do we even have sexual reproduction? It chops up half the useful mutations and just, just they are gone. It, sexual reproduction makes sense in a world that's trying to preserve from degenerative mutations. That It makes sense because God designed things good and it's trying to hold its best and so you can get rid of some of the bad ones with this. But why would that come along if we're waiting for those beneficial mutations? That was the primary driving force of biology. It's just not. And then Haldane's Dilemma. Look this up, Google it if you want, but Haldane's Dilemma is this problem in population genetics. How can you have enough offspring that after your beneficial mutation, you've got to replace the whole population with your offspring that has this new beneficial population? It has to get big enough so you can get another beneficial mutation, and then you've got to replace the population all over again, and you just can't possibly swap out enough nucleotides even just to get from an ape to a human in three million years. It doesn't make sense. So major mechanism challenges. But I want to wrap things up. We began by talking about 2 Peter chapter 3. And I want to end with this as well. The Bible predicts the coming of the scoffers, the skeptics. It says what they're going to say. It says how we can respond to them. But it also gives us some of their motivation. Why would they say, eh, there's no God. All things continue are as they are from the creation of the world. 2 Peter 3.10 gives their motivation, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat, and the earth shall be burned up. You see, my friends, if there is a creator, we are accountable. If there is a creator, he's going to call his creation to account. Let me tell you something. You are not an accident. You're not here as a result of a long evolutionary process. You're not just a bunch of chemical accidents. You were created by Almighty God for a purpose. God loves you and has a purpose for your life. Now, you can go on your life as if he doesn't exist. You can ignore him. But the day will come that you will stand before Almighty God. And the Bible says there's only two choices. Either we're going to a place called heaven or we're on our way to a place called hell, far apart from God. The Bible says it's appointed that the man wants to die, and after that, the judgment. Are you ready for that appointment? Are you ready for your appointment with Almighty God? We don't know if when it is. It might be today. It might be tomorrow. We, we could die on the way home tonight. We have no guarantees. Maybe there's somebody here, and they honestly, in their heart of hearts, would have to admit they've never made their peace with God. More important than any of these wonderful arguments for design would be for you to settle this matter of your eternal destiny. Where are you going to go when you die? Are you ready for that? Mm -hmm.